Institute for Faith and Culture. Uh, we're very uh, pleased to have you here uh, for the Bigger Lecture. Um, as always, it's good to see a variety of familiar faces and those I don't know. For those of you who might don't know, my name is Martin Dodderwhite, and I teach History of King and direct the King Institute for Faith and Culture. Uh, every year, we have been uh, graced with the support of the Frederick Beekner Center to offer a lecture in honor of Fred himself. And I'll talk a little bit more about him in the evening introduction as well. Fred's work has been formative on American Christianity in a variety of contexts. He's someone who's almost impossible to categorize, which makes his influence very elastic and very lasting and very uh, widespread. Fred has been a writer of novels and essays, sermons, memoirs, theology, and books that are hard to categorize. He's been an influence of King for some time, uh, not least because of Dale Brown, who founded the Beaker Institute for Faith and Culture in 2007. Dale, of course, wrote a book with Western, Westminster John Knox Press called The Book of Beekner, and his analysis and uh, advocacy of Beekner's work at King is still with us today. What Dale would cite often about Fred is that he would go to do a book event, and he would sit at the book table and somebody would come up to him and say, you saved my life. And that's the way people tended to respond to Fred's writing. Uh, and he had that kind of impact on ordinary uh, readers across the United States and elsewhere. I don't know if you've saved anybody's life here, but if so, you can, you can tell the chain later on. I tell him that anyway, and they can feel good. Uh, the Frederick Bigner Center is uh, a great promoter of Fred's work. Uh, they have uh, not only supported this lectureship, but also events in Princeton and elsewhere. And they have very generously provided us with a book table of some of Fred's books tonight. Um, and so if you're interested in reading some of them, they're all good. But we have a selection of books by Frederick Bigner available for sale, along with some by Jamie, and along with some that we have left over from previous lectures. So we have a, a variety of books available for you tonight. To exemplify Fred's work uh, and to honor his legacy, few people could be better than Jimmy Smith. Um, their writing in many ways overlaps, um, both in its breadth and its honesty, in its clarity, in its wit, and particularly in uh, Jamie's most recent book, in its uh, refusal, joyous refusal to be categorized. I'm not sure what to call on the road to St. Augustine, and that's a compliment. I mean that as a great compliment. Uh, Jamie is a graduate of Emmaus Bible College. He went to the Institute for Christian Studies in Toronto and received his PhD from Villanova. I got that right this time. Uh, I didn't this morning. Um, he taught briefly at Loyola Marymount University before going to Calvin College, where he now serves as the Gary and Henrietta Biker Chair in Applied Reformed Theology and Worldview. Did I get that correct? Two business kids. <laughs> it's, it's a mouthful. Jamie's writing uh, ranges broadly. You can see even on the book table tonight uh, the breadth of that writing. Um, it has been influential in a number of circles. You Are What You Love is probably the best, uh, wide, most widely read of these books, and it is, uh, I recommend it highly. It represents a kind of distillation of a three-volume set called the Cultural Liturgies Trilogy, which has been very influential in Christian higher education, including at King. Uh, many of us have spent a lot of time reading Jamie's books. Uh, we had book groups a couple of years ago when he was visiting to read Desiring the Kingdom and Imagining the Kingdom. And many of us got to spend a couple of days with him in Montreal, North Carolina, on an extended retreat where we talked about teaching. And we talked about the ways in which our work as teachers could draw on the, the material that we'll talk about a little bit in a moment. His relationship with King is long. He began as commencement speaker uh, many years ago when Dale invited him to do that. He has come as an institute speaker and he's done the retreat. Um, many of us not only have enjoyed his work, but have enjoyed his friendship along these, uh, these years as well. And I'm also happy to say that he is the most recent graduate of King University, <laughs> having received only this morning the D-Lit uh, Honoris Causa for his service to Letters and the University. And I think at the end of tonight, uh, President Whitaker is going to talk to you about supporting your alma mater. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Now that you're one of us. So please join me in welcoming Jamie Smith. My hope in what follows 
was is to, to take us on a little tour of Jamie's overall project and then also open it up to you for questions toward the end uh, as we spend this uh, hour or so together. I want to begin with something that seems a little counterintuitive. You're a philosopher and you are somebody who has spent your life doing philosophy and yet the starting point for a lot of your writing is saying that we shouldn't think about ourselves as thinking things. Can you comment on that? Yeah. Um... It is, uh, I, I sometimes have to uh, remind people that my project, my, my claim is that you are what you love, that, that we are really defined by our loves more than our thinking, even more than our beliefs. And I have to, of course, encourage people to remember that's not an anti-intellectual claim, uh, since I literally get paid to think, um, and I like my job. But it is, I do think it is a, it is a, wise philosophical conclusion to come to an appreciation for the limits of our rational capacities. Do you know what I mean? Like, I, I do think it is, it was philosophy that led me to realize, it was thinking about the nature of being human that helped me to appreciate that being human is about more than thinking, right? And that there's a, there's a deep holism in, in how God has made us. And, it, and it's also, I, I think it's a deeply sort of theological appreciation that to be human is to move into spaces of mystery. And if, if I worship a God that I could always figure out, it's almost certain that it's an idol. Right? If I, could, if I could sort of comprehend everything about God, it would mean that I've got this being that I can put in my intellectual box. And so it seems to me that there's an act of important intellectual humility to realize the limits, limits of thinking. The, the, the fun thing, I, I don't know how long you want me to talk for now, because I can talk forever, but it, one, one interesting sort of overlap. So, I mean, I reached that conclusion philosophically and theologically. We are more than what we think, right? We are what we love. Interestingly, just as a fun aside, I think it really resonates now with what we know from behavioral economics. So I don't know how much of you all think about behavioral economics. Okay, never mind. Take back that comment. But, so behavioral economics is, I mean, this is what people are winning Nobel, Richard Toller and Cass Sunstein and all these figures are saying. Even in, in the problem with sort of traditional economic theories is assume that when we are consumers, we are all doing these like rational cost-benefit analysis in our heads. And it turns out that's not true. We have all kinds of precognitive biases that shape why we do what we do. And I think it's an interesting time where people are starting to realize there's always more going on under the hood of our conscious awareness. And to take that seriously theologically and for our spiritual lives is sort of the project. Along those lines, um, when you start developing the, the, that we're not just brains on a stick, yeah. I think was your image, that we're something else. This has implications for church life, it has implications for economic life, it has implications for colleges along the way. Um, and you begin to relocate things a little bit. Uh, you use the phrase, you can't not love. You can't not love. And how is it that you arrive there? And, and what you love is the central aspect of defining who we are. So I, I think it's a, uh, there's kind of a twofold impetus to getting to that centrality of love. The first, the, to be honest, the proximate source is reading St. Augustine. So I, I don't know, in, in the opening paragraph of Augustine's Confessions, he, one of his, I still think one of his greatest lines, he's praying, he, all of the confessions are prayer, and he says to God, you have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Have you heard that before? You have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. I think it's really, really significant that, that the organ that he focuses on there, it's a metaphor, of course, but it's the heart. And uh, for Augustine, my sort of, the adventure of being human, my quest, is really about who I love and who I am loved by more than or even more fundamentally than that it's a question of what I believe or who I believe. Those aren't un unrelated, but it's, it's more fundamentally this question of the heart. So that's where all of a sudden now that sets bells and whistles off heart language. That's biblical language. And it seems to me that one of the reasons why the scriptures, uh, both Old and New Testament, use the language of the heart 
is because it's a way of sort of trying to describe the center and seat of the human person that kind of shifts the center of gravity a little lower than just what we are thinking and believing and knowing and, and conceiving and realizing that this is kind of the seat of our hungers, our longings, our desires. So when the psalmist says, you know, my heart pants like a deer by the water, uh, um, that kind of craving, hungering, desiring, that seems to me to get at something that is most fundamentally human. In my heart, you don't mean just emotions. You're talking about something that you use the word gut. Yes, yes. One of the problems with heart language today is it's kind of been ruined by Hallmark, right? So, so what that means is when we, when we hear the language of heart, we just think sort of sappy, sentimental, emotionalism, which is not what the scriptures mean. Um, uh, it, it's interesting. I think both St. Paul and uh, Cranmer in the Book of Common Prayer talk about a heart that thinks. A heart that thinks. I, that, I think, is exactly the idea that, um, now, I do think emotions are part of this. I, I, I should say, I, I'm, I'm, I'm so pleased to be in the Presbyterian Church, and I come from the Reformed tradition. One of the reasons, I guess, I was endeavoring in this book is because we also tend to be a little bit thinking thingist and brain on a sticky, and, and we don't always have a very good place for emotion in our theology as Reformed Presbyterians. And, and I've got enough charismatic streak in me that I'm, I know that God is also restoring and using and meeting me in my emotions. But the heart is not just synonymous with emotionalism. Uh, it's really getting at this sort of seat and engine of our desires. And so desire uh, becomes a key theme for you yeah. along the way, shaping desire, and we'll come to the, the role of habit in a minute. A phrase that you use that I think uh, throws everybody off in a great way is the phrase erotic compass. And I, first of all, I want to say it's a great name for a band. And I think, I think you know, the erotic compasses, I think uh, you might have some disappointed patrons, but I think it would be a great name for a band. Um, what do you mean by erotic compass? Yeah, yeah so the, the picture here is that um, to say that human beings are lovers, fundamentally, first and foremost, is to say that we are animated by craving, longing, desire. And I use all of those words synonymous with love. Now, one of the things you have to work through then is, especially in kind of churchy worlds, and we, we know like this distinction between Greek words for love, because we've all heard sermons on John 20, so you know, Jesus said, Peter, do you love me? And the word was agape, one of the Greek words. And we know that Peter said in response, yes, Lord, I phileo you. I have friendly feelings towards you. So we know there's these different words for love. And we know that agape love is Christian love, good Christian love. And then we hear vaguely that there's this third kind of word in Greek for love that's eros, which sounds naughty. <laughs> Eros, erotic, that sounds like, no, that can't be good. Um, unless you're married, maybe. But, but it, it, that, what's disappointing about that, however, is um, the problem isn't Eros. We, we've kind of, the culture has basically let Eros be taken over by porneia, I would say, which is a very, very disappointing reality. Instead, what I would say is agape is rightly ordered eros, right? To, be say, to say that we are created by God as erotic beings is saying we are made to crave the God who made us, right? It's a deeply, you see this in the female mystics, for example, in the medieval tradition. You see this deeply, uh, this deep desire for God. And you see this played out in Augustine's confessions in life and so on. I think honoring that erotic nature of who we are and realizing that God doesn't come to sort of crush desire. God comes to reorder and answer and be the answer of our desire. I also think culturally, sorry, I might be stealing from a later question, but I think culturally it also helps us to analyze kind of where late modern culture has gone off the rails. Or it's one way to diagnose what's going on in contemporary culture, which is that people are kind of looking for love in all the wrong places. That, that is, the, the problem isn't that people have desire, it's, the problem is that people are trying to satisfy what is a, a God-shaped 
God-oriented desire in all kinds of substitutes. And, and to honor that sort of erotic nature of who we are as human beings, I think, um, honors our kind of finitude, it honors our embodiment, it honors our, uh, um, the physicality, I think, of, of how God has made us. And as you start to talk about desire, um, one of the things that your, your work will tend to get into is the imagination. And how our desire is shaped by the idea of an end, a telos, uh, along the way. I think of uh, C.S. Lewis in uh, a number of places, but I, what's coming to mind is the Pilgrim's Regress. Uh, where he has this image of a, of a garden that he can see through a wall, but he can't quite get there. He gets the, he gets the vision of it, but he, he's not there, and it keeps driving him in terms of his desire. How is it then that our imagining of the kingdom, our desiring the kingdom, and what, what do we mean by the kingdom, and how does that become a way of becoming our compass? Okay, so, all right, so let's see. Um, so, first of all, the reason why... Uh, I suggest that there's this kind of interplay, overlap, resonance between desire and imagination. Is because both of them are like aspects of human uh, orientation to the world that are precognitive and pre-intellectual. In other words, both imagination and desire are at work in us and are propelling us under the hood of our conscious awareness. Does that make sense? So what I mean by imagination here isn't just like fantasy. It's not just like projecting and making something up. For me, the imagination is more like a faculty by which we sort of feel our way around the world. We make sense of our world, but in a way before thinking. Does that, does that make sense? So to imagine the world, is to also say something like this. I think to say that all human beings are lovers and long for something ultimate is to also say that human beings are the kinds of creatures who are captivated by some vision of the good life. Every, you can't, this is a claim just about human beings. It's not a claim about religion, just religious human beings. So to be human is just to be the kind of creature who lives and moves and have, has our being in such a way that I'm always living towards some vision of what I think flourishing is, some vision of what I think the good life is. And that vision is hardly ever a set of ideas that someone has convinced me of. It's more likely a picture of a, vi of a, a life lived that has captured my imagination and now I, I'm attracted to it. Do you see the difference? It's less being convinced by a set of ideas and it's more being, it's the dynamics of a lure where I say, oh, that, that world looks like a world where I could be happy. Now, the key thing is, that could be happening to me without my ever thinking about it, right? So you, you don't realize, or another way to put it is, I might not realize the extent to which my heart hungers have been captivated by a vision of the good that I have never evaluated, never thought about, never, and yet I spend my whole life chasing it because I've been immersed in a world that keeps telling me, not convincing me, but picturing for me, saying, oh, this is what being human really looks like. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. So, you, had, you, you were cheating and had a bunch of questions in one I question. Did. And so I'm trying to, I don't know if I answered all of them, but... You're seeing if you're a worthy King College graduate. Yes. <laughs> this is the oral exam that goes with the honors of Kyle's a doctor. Yeah. Um, so I, I think one of the things that you've identified, I think this is in um, Desiring or You Are What You Love, I, the sense that very often we have a, if you ask us to articulate what is our vision of a good life, we would say something that sounds right to us, but in fact, we don't actually live like this. Yes. And that there may be ways that we can see what our vision of the good life is more from how we act than from what I would, than from what I would offer as a kind of road answer. Yes, so, um, and there's, there's kind of, this is a double-edged sword, or there's two, two, two shoes that drop? I don't know, uh, that you have no shoes on. Um, what I mean is this, so you are what you love but you might not love what you think. 
That's, that's the sort of discomforting reality to sort of live into, right? If, if my loves, my longings, my desires are captivated by some image of the good life, some vision of the good life, but I'm not thinking through that, then here's the thing. I might actually be living out a vision of the good life that my heart has been sort of magnetically pulled toward, even though if you asked me, what is the good life? My articulated answer is, oh, it's over there. Well, here's the thing. All I see is you're chasing over there. And that's because your loves have been captivated by something other than what your mind has been convinced of. Do you feel, do you feel the difference between those two things? Now, I think, um, I, I should say, this is why I'm a philosopher. I, the reason why everybody should take a course in philosophy is it's just an occasion to hit pause on the autopilot of your life and stand back and ask, why do I do what I do? That's really what philosophy, ever since Socrates, philosophy has all been about hitting a pause button, stepping out of our everyday immersion and asking, huh, why do I do that? What is the good? Something like that. Um, I think for the most part, the default of late modern culture is we all just run on autopilot. And what that means, however, in our late modern culture is if we all just run on autopilot, we all basically end up loving stuff. Right? In other words, I think the default formation of our loves in late modern culture is overwhelmingly consumerism. And by the way, that is a cross-class structure. So the poor are as susceptible to consumerism as the rich. Because uh, the, I think the default not thinking about it, nature of our culture is just keeps holding out this false promise that stuff will make you happy. So uh, um, in a sense, for somebody, there can be almost like a portal to the gospel for somebody who's just going through the motions of their life to hit pause and ask, what is this all about? Like, what am I chasing? What is this after? But for Christians now, I also think, this is where we're really talking about sanctification. And, and for a Christian, we need to realize Christians are not immune <laughs> to my loves being co-opted by other stories of what the good life is. Even though I might know all the answers to the catechism. You could have memorized all the answers to the catechism. But if you haven't appreciated that, in fact, your loves are, are good, operative on the level of the imagination, you don't realize how much other stories have kind of captured your heart. So, and that's the, that's the tough part that I think Christians have to sort of lean into and take stock of their life. And this leads us naturally to the title of your trilogy, the Cultural Liturgies Trilogy. Um, when we start to pull back the veil, and use the word apocalyptic, pulling back the veil, we start to try to look through those visions of the good life and see what they actually are. Um, try to unmask the things that we may not have seen. We arrive at habit-forming practices that we often participate in without our knowledge. And these are what you're calling liturgies. Can you unpack that phrase for us? Yeah, so um, on this picture, if I am what I love, and my loves are operative on this desire of longing, on this order of longing and desire. What we also need to realize is that my loves, those habits and those longings and desires are forms of habit. Now what we mean by habit here, it's, it's actually a very ancient notion of habit, but the point is they are dispositions, sort of defaults that have been woven into me by the rhythms, routines, and rituals that I have given myself over to. Does that make sense? In other words, the habits of my heart, there's the great Robert Bellow book, the habits of my heart, the sort of default disposition of hunger of my heart is not the fruit of my thinking. You don't, you don't actually think your way to your loves. You practice your to your loves. And, and in that, if that's true, I mean, we, the book tries to prove it. I won't prove it here tonight. But if, if we practice our way to our loves, 
Well, then we need to start asking ourselves, what am I learning to love given what I give myself over to practice? Does that make sense? So liturgies is kind of, it's a small L. It's me trying to take a sort of churchy word, but elasticize it and say, if rituals, rhythms, and routines are heart-shaping, love-forming practices, then in fact, there are liturgies everywhere. Right, Jimmy? Liturgies are not confined to the sanctuary of the church. There are all kinds of liturgies in our culture, not because they're trying to train me to love God, but because many of them are trying to train me to love everything, but, or all kinds of things instead of God. Does that, so, uh, do, do you want to talk about an example, or? Sure. Do, choose, your, choose your example. Yeah, I mean, depends how much you want to upset people. <laughs> uh, I mean, this, in some ways, the safest example, because I think we all sort of own it, but, uh, um, see, if, if you think about cultural rhythms, routines, and practices now as liturgies, and you start to look at our cultural immersion and practices in that way, all of a sudden you put on this liturgical lens of cultural analysis, and something like the mall starts to look a lot different. Right now the mall is a religious site. Not because when you walk into the mall, somebody meets you at the door and says, here's the 15 things that the mall believes. I mean, the last thing the mall wants you to do is think, right? Does that mean it's not, there's nothing religious at stake in the mall? Uh, no, I wouldn't say that. I would say there's something deeply religious at stake in the mall because the mall does want to shape what you love. It wants to change what you want. It wants you to want stuff. And it wants you to think stuff will make you happy. And it's not going to convince your intellect of that. It's going to sort of inscript your imagination to start falling prey to that story. The mall has an unbelievable evangelism program. It's called marketing. And and here's the thing. And I, by the way, I'm not I, I'm not I'm not naively uh, um, poo pooing either capitalism or marketing in this. It's much more complicated than that. All in fact, I would say marketing is one of the sectors of our culture that best knows we are what we love and not what we think. That's why marketing doesn't try to change your mind. It tries to pull your heart straight. Right? Tries to paint a picture of a world that you want to live into. So there's all, when you put on this liturgical analysis, all of a sudden, all kinds of everyday things that you thought were just something that you do, you start to realize, oh, these are doing something to me. And I, I think we need to, I think you can look at stadiums in that way. I think, yeah, you can, uh, as, as a Canadian who has become an American citizen, um, I have to tell you, I still walk down the National Mall in D.C., and, and all I can think of is Mars Hill, Act 17, the Areopagus, where Paul says, you seem like a very religious people. <laughs> right? And so it just sort of transforms what you think we're doing because you realize that what we're doing is also doing something to us. Uh, and I think the mall at Christmas is going to ramp that up. The liturgical calendar of the mall is a powerful <laughs> thing, and it has all of its own Colors of the liturgical seasons. I mean, there's there's literally a consumer liturgical calendar that has actually way more. Everything is a feast day because they have to sell you new products, right? And it starts with Valentine's Day and it works its way up to Christmas and the High Holy Day is Black Friday. Yeah. Saint Black Friday. Yes, that's your yes. um, so the cultural liturgy analysis becomes a big part of, of what uh, you talk about in the three volume series and also you are what you love. Um, and the phrase that I love in there is caught not taught. That this is the way that we tend to, to take these things on, these habits. Um, I want to shift gears a little bit uh, from that uh, overall project of those books to a little bit of what you've done with the Augustine book and another book very widely used, uh, How Not to Be Settler. Can I put one, one footnote to just before we change gears? Footnote away. The other thing, there is a constructive side to this, which is also the whole point of that analysis that we've just carried out, is also supposed to reframe what we think God is doing in the church. Right? In other words, if our hearts are liturgically formed by rhythms, routines, rituals, and practices, liturgies, 
then now all of a sudden I hope it reframes what's at stake when the people of God gather for worship. That is, God is going to recalibrate the hard compass in the word and sacrament of the gathered assembly, rehearsing God's story about the world rather than these rival stories. So there's really, there is supposed to be a constructive part of the argument that leads to a renewal of our intentionality about liturgy and worship in our congregations. And that's the constructive. That's, we need countermeasures. Okay. That, that's on page two. Oh, sorry. Okay, okay sorry. sorry. <laughs> um, in, in the book on Charles Taylor, uh, a Canadian social theorist uh, of, of great note, but also very difficult to understand for mere mortals, uh, in his 800-page tome, uh, and also in your new book on Augustine, one of the things that I, I greatly appreciate with your work is giving voice to people other than yourself. And I like the way that you've offered that kind of uh, reframing for, for Charles Taylor, who is such a, an important thinker, um, and for Augustine as well in the modern sense. Um, Tom Oden, at one point, theologian from Drew University, says he had this dream in which he sees a, a, his own Grave, so it says he wrote no new theology. Yeah. And to him, that was a very important thing. So, how is it that you see your project as part of an ongoing theological conversation that's 2,000 years old? Oh, that's a great question. Um, yeah, there, there, there have been various, um, I would say probably 15 years ago. No, gosh, I've been old now, 20 years ago. Uh, it began at my, in my experience at Villanova. I, I think I started to just realize, Robert Weber was a really important influence on this too, that my name might mean something to some of you, but I, I became convinced that the future of the church is ancient. That is, one of the best things we could do for the renewal and what the French call the resourcement of the church, uh, um, uh, Jesuit Henri de Lubac is actually really influential on this, one of the best things we could do for positioning the church for the future of the faith was to go back and mine the wisdom and treasures of the ancient and medieval traditions. And I say that even as an unapologetic Protestant, but a Protestant of a Catholic flavor. That is, I still see myself as heir of the great tradition. And so, like John Calvin, by the way, I see all the work of the ancient church fathers and those medieval doctors as a gift that continues to give. And I think one of the saddest things about contemporary American Christianity is how stunted its historical imagination is. I mean, there's, listen, there's a lot of congregations where Christianity is as old as the youth pastor. Do you know what I mean? Like they just can't, or they can't imagine beyond the founding of their non-denominational Church. They just don't, they didn't know Christianity was old enough. And, and in a sense, but, but then Protestantism in general has just been a little bit guilty of saying, well, we'll go back to 1531 or so. And I'm like, um, there's so much ancient treasure for us to discover about practices of the Christian life that will take us forward. So I, I just try to be um, a recoverer. Uh, in that sense, and, and bear witness to it, and then try to do some of that translation. One of the things that I try to do in class is, is uh, I do a lot of church history courses, and I, I like to go back and say, I'm in the Reformed tradition as well, but when we go back to medieval Christianity, here's something that's non-literate. And it's so hard for us to get ourselves out of the mode of thinking that Christianity is fundamentally about reading printed words and define their practices and habit-forming exercises that are so rich. And, and Which also. seems especially timely. I mean, we are still obviously a literate culture, but we are also increasingly an image-based culture. And so I think if we want to imagine what does faithful witness look like in a, in a culture in which the image is the primary currency almost, um, I think exactly. You go back to pre-literate uh, uh, traditions and heritages and you realize, oh, that's what stained glass was doing, right? Oh, this is why architecture was so important. There's, you can see, um, and to me that honors, again, the holism of being human. I, I think what happened is there, there is a naughty, uh, K-N-O-T-T-Y, not an N-A-U-G-H-T-Y, but there's a naughty relationship between Protestantism and modernity. 
And insofar as I think modernity gave us some really bad habits, we have to try to sift out and also in some places take blame at how Protestantism had a tendency to take us in some wrong terms. And so I think you can also renew Protestantism by remembering those pre-Protestant sources. And one of those, and you, you bring this up about Charles Taylor, uh, who is Catholic, um, is the role of exemplars. And part of our theme this year, which I want to turn around to a little bit here toward the end, uh, which comes from Pope Benedict XVI, before he was Pope, he gives his famous sermon, in which he says the church's two great apologia are the beauty of its art and the holiness of its saints. And uh, one of the things that you cite from Taylor is the role of the exemplar. The saint is somebody that I use as a way of forming myself over against modernity. Could you comment on that a little bit? Yeah, and, and interestingly, it also, that theme, I, I'm so, I love that quote, and, and um, that theme also resonates with everything we were talking about in terms of love as a habit. So the, the, to say love as a habit is actually to tap into ancient virtue theory, virtue accounts of the human person. And actually, the two ways that you establish habits are, one is through practices, through the rhythms and routines that train, you know, build a groove in your heart. But actually, the other way is imitation. Uh, you see the model, the exemplar, and you sort of inch your way towards knowing how to love well by imitating the one you love as well. Now, imitation is a deeply biblical theme, right? Paul, how often does Paul say, be imitators of me? as I imitate Christ, that imitatio Christi. What I love about that sort of legacy of exemplars is, and it's what I love about Augustine, I'll say, is um, you can sort of imagine the possibilities of sanctified humanity because you're meeting humans. I mean, I, I, know, I, know, I know I'm supposed to imitate Jesus, I, I get that. But you can also understand why that sometimes feels just slightly out of reach. Uh, even though the incarnation and the condescension of God into human form is, is, of course, the only thing that saves us, there is also then something about this richness of the legacy of the saints. And so when you meet somebody like Augustine, who's actually really willing to be vulnerable in confessing to you all the ways that he still fails, um, uh, there's a... There's a certain motivation there, but they also exemplify, I think the saints are their own beauty, right? They, that there's a, and of course I value the, the, the um, communion of the saints and the cult of the saints, but there's also a sense in which uh, my wife Deanna has, uh, her grandma's name is Doris Curry, and I, I just want to, every time I get a chance, I want to name her as a saint you will never meet. She's 93 years old. I can absolutely guarantee you she has been praying for me every single day since I became a Christian on October 10th, 1988. She has endured the suffering of alcoholism in her family uh, uh, in the mining town of Sudbury, Ontario, and she is the most steadfast, faithful witness. And for me, it, it, when I think, you know, part of me wants to be Charles Taylor, but if I was, on my best days, I want to be Doris Curry. And to just know what it is to live into the everyday saints in our lives, I, I think um, that's, what, that's what makes, that's a kind of imagining um, that is as alluring as the stained glass. I think of Beatrice's work in Godric. Godric almost immediately wants you to forget everything that looks miraculous. And he wants to tell you how ordinary this is. And he pulls us right back. Or, or um, Taylor talks about Jeremy and Hopkins yes. as a saint, also somebody with some trouble. Thomas Merton in Seven Story Mountain also has a beautiful reflection on this French couple that kind of raised him when he was a young boy. And he talks about them in terms of ordinary saints. And, and at one point he says, uh, um, if I believe in heaven, which he does, it's because I want to be able to say thank you to them. And I, I think it's just gorgeous. That's great. So taking that theme, that phrase from Ratzinger, um, the beauty of art, the holiness of saints, how do you see those as ways that we can orient ourselves now, that we can inculcate habits? Yeah, and what I love is that those, um, they are also kind of inseparable. But it's interesting. One of the reasons why I, I recently took on the editorship of Image Journal, which is a quarterly journal devoted to art, mystery, and faith. 
and it's totally related to why you selected this theme, which is, I really believe the best shot of the gospel capturing the imagination of our secular age is going to be pictured in literature, film, painting, sculpture, more than it's going to be argued for by op-eds and dissertations. And, and, and I mean, I'm still committed to the academic project, but I just think it's precisely because we are these imaginative creatures that the arts um, tap into us obliquely, covertly. They sneak up on people, I think. And, and I think they can insert themselves into the cracks that we are seeing in our secular age where people are showing that they are hungrier than they would let on sometimes. And I think um, uh, the arts are also such a powerful way to give voice to those ordinary saints um, who, who live lives of beautiful sacrifice that make us imagine a different way of, of being human. And, um, I'm encouraged, I think more and more people are sort of getting this vision. I think we are a long ways from Christian communities having an adequate uh, appreciation of how the arts work. We still have a little bit of a tendency to treat them as another means of conveying a message uh, rather than actually capturing the imagination, but I'm hopeful. I think that there's a recent collaboration between the artist Bruce Herman and the poet Malcolm Geit, where he studies portraits of ordinary saints, and it's a wonderful example of that. There are hopeful signs. Um, could you give us then, in a, in a hopeful sense, some of the ways in which you cast the, uh, the role of positive liturgies, of worship together, of life together in the church, of life as families, as ways of reforming ourselves? Yeah, so, I mean, um, maybe a couple aspects I would highlight. For, first of all, I, I, my project is trying to make an argument for contemporary uh, Christianity and I guess probably mostly Protestantism, just because that's my audience, to remember and recover historic wisdom about what worship could and should look like, right? So I, I would talk about what I would call historic Christian worship, historic liturgy, uh, um, which doesn't necessarily by the way mean pipe organs and sort of stodginess. It means the logic of a narrative that is rehearsed when the people of God gather, are called by God around word and table, so that what's going on is, it's not just a performance, it's not a scenario in which I come to show God something. To be gathered in worship is actually to encounter a God who is calling me and is doing, who is the prime actor in worship. We're not putting on a show for God. God is calling us into his very life. And that's why then the script of worship has this sort of narrative arc about it in the sense that it is rehearsing the story of God and Christ reconciling the world to himself over and over again in ways, hopefully, that are tangible, tactile, visual, embodied, uh, um, imaginative, which is one of the reasons why I think worship should always end at the Lord's table. Uh, I'll put it in, I was going to say Eucharist, but that it should, it should end at communion. Why? Because communion is the most embodied recapitulation of the gospel. Every single time. It, it is the act of worship that touches every single sense of the human body. We taste, we smell, we see, we hear, we touch. That is God inviting us into a new story. And, and part of the key to this, however, is also embracing repetition, which is an odd thing for some of us. We have a kind of allergy to repetition, but if you don't embrace repetition, all that means is you're just going to let all the cultural liturgies win. Um, if, we, if we see that repetition isn't fake, repet we don't repeat these things because we weren't trying to show God something anyway, so it's not fake to repeat it. It's receiving a gift over and over again because God is restoring and re reschooling our hearts in that sense. So, yeah, I, I, I have strong feelings about this. I mean, that's kind of my soapbox. Um, the other thing I'll say, though, is um, I really do believe that a lot of young people who are ready to walk away from Christianity are mostly walking away from a Christian 
Christianity that has operated on a very narrow bandwidth of kind of didactic, legalistic, heady. It's never been something that has been visceral and tactile for them. And, and um, or they are walking away from what I would call happy, clappy extroverts for Jesus, which is everything that their youth group has taught them Christian, the Christian life is supposed to look like. We, we hire the ideal youth, uh, apologies to that. Uh, I leave tomorrow, so whatever. <laughs> <laughs> We, we, we do have a bit of the template of the youth pastor, don't we, right? And it's this super peppy, excited, eager person who's always so bubbly. And, and uh, um, in so doing, we almost make extroversion holiness. We make peppiness sanctification. And there's a lot of young people who are just not wired for that. But that's the only model of seriousness on fire for Jesus that they've seen. And so they're like, oh, if that's what a Christian is, I could never be that. And so they're like, I guess I can't be a Christian. That should not happen. In my experience, when you meet somebody who's just in that phase, and you give them, Joe's going to love this, but you give them the Book of Common Prayer. Or you tell them, you teach them, you know, as John Calvin would have told them, you know, you can pray the Psalms every morning and evening. You don't have to make it up. You can receive from God a prayer that you can give back to God. And they're like, are you kidding me? So it's not on me? I don't have to like innovate for the sake of my salvation? No, no, no. Like grace, all of this is gift too. And that that's kind of, I've absolutely banked my hope of the future of the church on that not trying to outperform and out entertain the world. Um, we have a few more minutes. If I, I want to open it up to the floor, if anybody has a question, comment uh, for Jamie. So I was going to frame this as a hardball and ask you if you're an evangelical. But I'll just ask you to position your views side by side with what you take to be evangelicalism. Uh, so, Evangelical is not a name I give myself. I'll say that. Um, I'm reformed. I am a confessional Protestant. And I seriously think of myself as a Catholic Christian. In the terms of the Apostles' Creed, I believe in one holy Catholic church. Um, I have, I, I guess I've never really had any investment in evangelical which has always just felt very amorphous to me, and I've never known where the center is. Whereas, as a confessional Protestant, I would say I'm a Nicene Christian for whom the Heidelberg Catechism and the Belgian Confession are accents on how I receive the gift of Catholic Christianity. And I, I, I think, now that's, that's still pretty unapologetically Protestant, but I just don't have any investment in a lot of the sociological dynamics that go along with being evangelical either. Um, and it, but it might also partly explain why someone like me, I would, I'm much more interested in renewing the main line um, than, than saving independent evangelicalism. But that's just, I, I'm not, that's not a normative claim, that's just a confession, sort of where, where I place my investment. Interestingly, at Calvin College, now Calvin University, where I teach, we've actually never really self-identified as evangelical. Uh, and I think that's partly because our version of being reformed has always been this continental European story, and so it's an interesting dynamic. I mean, of course, you guys are the historians, you know this better than I. Others? Uh, in your account, where do you place the agency of the Holy Spirit? Yeah. Art. I, I want to get at this charismatic streak. Did you say streak. in art? No, in, in all of this. Yes, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to get at this charismatic streak you're talking about. I, and I didn't hear the last I want to get at your charismatic streak. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, so I almost always get this question, which means I'm doing something wrong. Um, <laughs> so the, que the question was, where is the role of the Holy Spirit in this picture of formation and so on and so forth? 
And, 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 and Sam's right, I, I do have, I have a sort of tenure sojourn with the Pentecostal Church and would still happily identify as charismatic. By the way, I think the charismatic movement has also been one of the greatest engines for the ecumenical nature of the body of Christ. So the way I think of it is um, the spirit is operative in these practices. They are, Craig Dijkstra says, these, you know, these liturgical practices, the spiritual disciplines, are habitations of the spirit. So they are, this is a deeply, I think, sacramental picture, but the point, the idea is, these practices are the conduit of the spirit. And what I, what I get nervous about is the way contemporary uh, Protestantism tends to identify the spirit with a kind of emotional verve. Um, which I'm not opposed to, I just don't want to reduce the spirit to that. Now, I would say, as a parent, when my kids were teenagers, I actually staked a lot in Jesus' promise that the spirit is present in these practices. That's what sacraments are, right? And so I, I, I'm confident that the spirit is in these and doing something, even if they're not feeling it, so to speak. Um, on the other hand, it's interesting, I did a workshop on a Pentecost uh, weekend in Nashville a couple of years ago, and it brought together an Episcopal church and a Pentecostal church, which was really, really great fun. And it, here's what that tends to happen. When I talk to um, my Pentecostal friends, I try to say to them, now you know, the spirit that miraculously heals also makes the sun come up every single day. You know that's the same spirit, right? Like the spirit can operate that way. But then when I'm talking to my musical friends, I'm like, you know God could surprise you once in a while, right? Like, you know that there's the, the, this, the script could be upended, uh, and, and God might just blow your mind. And I, I don't ever want to preclude the Spirit's miraculous, supernatural uh, um, surprise. I also just want to rely on the faithfulness of the Spirit to the gifts of God that He's given to the people of God. That's sort of Sounds pretty Presbyterian now that I say that. Yeah. <laughs> At what point does the ego begin to interfere with our pre Uh Probably incessantly. <laughs> so, interestingly, I, I, I don't track necessarily with a Freudian picture of these things. There's a really interesting conversation going on in the last 10 years about what's called the new unconscious, which is a sort of an account of the unconscious that isn't quite freighted with the Freudian picture, but still honors the fact that there's stuff going on in us that we aren't cognitively deliberating on. And um, I actually, I don't want to set this up as a dichotomy between the two. Instead, I want to picture this sort of constructive feedback loop that can be happening where, because I mean, I write books. People read those books and it leads them to think. I want their thinking, so obviously I'm pro-thinking, but the whole point is for their thinking to become a reflection on their practices so that they can become more intentional about their pre -cognitive. And so it's trying to paint that constructive relationship, head and heart, so to speak, and and making sure that there's a synergy between the two. Yeah. That might not be quite the answer to your question. Do you feel any uh, use of the uh, mystic philosophy? Or do you, uh, do you feel that you uh, have more call from Van Til? Uh, definitely not Van Til, but I feel um, so. The way I have shaped and formed, um, uh, so yeah, Aquinas is, is um, has been a, a heritage and formation for me. It's just that within Catholic philosophy, there's actually a little bit of a team Aquinas and team Augustine. So that's an ongoing conversation within the history of Catholic philosophy, and I lean team Augustine, even though I, I I'm I'm setting it up like they're here and here. It's more like an overlapping Venn's diagram, right? And there's a lot of overlap and similarity between them, but they just disagree. Aquinas, for example, is often described as an intellectualist.
That is, he thinks that intellect precedes will. Whereas Augustine actually thinks the formation of the will transforms what the intellect can contemplate. I think Augustine's right on that. Uh, so I just have sympathies in that regard. Um, it's one of the reasons, but, um, I mean, Aquinas is helpful on so many things. Uh, but the trajectory that I follow goes more through Augustine and then Blaise Pascal, who's one of the great Augustinians. Uh, if, if, I, yeah, if I wrote another book trying to translate people, it might be Blaise Pascal, who I think is so underappreciated and another existentialist in a way. Um, and then that sort of Kierkegaardian track. So that's just the way I'm wired, but I'm not opposed to it. I mean, there's room for both, but here's the thing. I actually think classical rationalist apologetics is, for the most part, a misbegotten enterprise today. Um, uh, now, so let me walk back. <laughs> Easy, Jake. Um, uh, well, first of all, I, I also think a lot of forms of apologetics assume that there is available to us some sort of universal rationality, which I also just don't think is the case. Um, what I do, I, let's say this, you are right to intuit that I do think that there are apologetic implications of this picture of the human person. Because now the goal of apologetics isn't arguing people to accept the right answer to a question. It's painting a picture for people of a vision of how to be human that resonates with God's kingdom, right? And I think it's why I would rather pursue the arts than apologetics. However, I also think there could be an apologetics that leans on the imaginative end of the spectrum. So my friend Josh Shatro has a new book, and of course now I won't be able to take the title of it. It's also with Mark Allen, so that'll help you find it. It's big and green, and it's published by Sondra. Uh, in which he kind of reframes the apologetic project in light of exactly Taylor and sort of you are what you love kinds of arguments, and I think it's an interesting conversation. Yes, no, this is very important. I, I, so interestingly, I, Sam and I were just talked about this before too. Um, so catechesis, sort of training in the faith. I actually think, and historically this was the case, I think. I, I think the best catechesis is liturgically indexed. So let, let me, what that is, I think the best way to induct people into the Christian faith and the gospel is to actually teach them why we do what we do when we worship. Because if you do that, and the worship is the rehearsal of the gospel, then you are, people will understand why they, first of all, need to give themselves over to worship. I also think part of such catechesis is waking them up to the rival stories, right? Waking them up to uh, um, the deformative liturgies that they've been participating in. So this is how, this is exactly why I think what Augustine would have called the ancient catechumenate, the process by which somebody made their way to the Christian faith in Augustine's day, is a great model for us. Because for Augustine, have you ever heard this phrase, you belong before you believe? That's, that's the ancient catechumenate was a model where, oh, you're intrigued, you're a seeker, you're not sure what you believe. Well, come, be part of our community, sort of live into some of the practices. We are going to train you and to help you understand why we are doing these things. And it might be the case that by being with us, by belonging to us, by participating in these practices, then the gospel becomes plausible for you in a way. You practice your way into believing. I think um, that's one way to think about what evangelism looks like. I think it's also the way to think about what the formation of young people in the faith looks like. I'm, I'm a huge fan of things like the Catechesis of the Good Shepherd and 
other forms of the catechesis of young people that makes it revolve around the story of God rehearsed in worship. And from there then, building intellectual capacities for reflection. Does, does that make sense? I feel like I might not be answering the question, but um, I do think, um, so despite the fact that I'm arguing we are what we love and not what we think, I also think we have a serious failure of thinking in the church. We, we have didacticism, but we don't actually have really, really good, biblically attuned, critical capacities. And I, I think there's so much growth for that to happen. Yeah. What are the wise components of church service? Like, what are the wise components of a church service? Um, confession. So I, I'm, I'm just going to pick a couple highlights. Um, so. I'm, I travel a lot, and I end up in all kinds of different churches, uh, some of which I would never choose to go to otherwise. And I have to say, one of the most jarring experiences for me is to be in a Sunday service in which there is no moment of confession and assurance of pardon. So this is, this is a moment, in case folks aren't familiar, this is a moment where collectively, in God, in, having been called by God and brought into God's presence, and greeted by a holy God, we also become aware of our sinfulness. And God invites us to confess our sins before Him. And it's a reminder of our sin, our brokenness, our transgression. Our, it's a way to own that. But the whole point is to restore relationship because there will never be confession without assurance of pardon. Mercy, absolution. Both of those acts, I think, are deeply countercultural. And... For me, if I'm in a worship service and neither of those things happen, I don't know what story we're telling anymore. Do you know what I mean? Like it's like it's like you've lifted out this really crucial chapter of the book, and I don't know what's going on. Um, I'll also say I'm just gonna I guess pick some of my favorite pieces of what historic Christian worship is. This will sound like a weird one, but um, what do you what do you guys call prayers of the people? Prayers of the people. Okay. So prayers of the people, it's called sometimes it's called the pastoral prayer and so on. Prayers of the people is this beautiful moment in worship where the people of God become priests for the world. That is, we pray and we bring the concerns of our congregation, our neighborhood, our city, our country, our world, and we lift all of those up to God in prayer in the context of worship because it also reminds us that God calls about, cares about every single aspect. And to be in a congregation that does that over and over and over again is to be reminded and to live in a into a story in which God cares about this particular person's uh, um, struggle with cancer. And he cares about the systemic structural racism that we're dealing with in real estate in our city. Do you know what I mean? And, and that he cares that that war is awful. Right? And all of these things remind us about aspects of God's peace and walking. Um, what I, I do think every worship service should end with communion. Uh, and then I also think it's really important that a worship service begins with a call to worship and ends with a benediction. And it's not just we turn down the lights and the band plays louder and then you're dismissed. Because that's a different story. That is a performance. That is a concert. That, you're, that you're, you've just rehearsed a different story. To, to live into a story in which worship is a call to worship is actually to hear an echo of Genesis 1 and 2 every single time you come to church. God recreates us and recalls us. And actually when you hear the benediction, you are also hearing an echo of Genesis 1. Go, be fruitful and multiply, tend and steward the garden, right? I mean, go be the image bearers that God has made us to be. So it's recapitulating the biblical story over and over again. Yeah. This is this is uh, chapter four of You Are What You Love, by the way. Yes. Thank you. Um, thank you for being here. So much of uh, your concerns and your admonitions and our solidity and the structure of the worship service and things we do in communities, churches, uh, reminds me of a young John Henry Lima in his days of trying to pull Oxford through the sort of things that he he brought to the attention of his congregation. Of course, we know how this story is. Yeah. It's recent. Uh, yeah, there's a Exactly. Um, so, which I guess leads me, it's a two-part question. One is, I guess this is also coming from a recent essay by Sandy Harlow, where he, he 
asked the question, basically, what are we doing as Protestants? So much of what we were literally Protestants were protesting has been reformed. So what do we do now, right? What's our, what's our, what's our play? What's our position? Um, and so many people ask me, Which I think is, is a beautiful call for unity in Christianity. But I guess um, sort of the question around you know, when we leave here and we go back to our religious, religious churches, um, what, what should we continue to protest? Because so much of, I think, of Protestants are protesting is actually, a, is actually protesting as Protestant. Yeah. yeah, mostly Protestants should right. protest in Protestantism right now, so, for the most part, yes. So we're just sort of yes. like, we're just stepping away and away. Yeah, and away. yeah. Well, so, so the question would then be, um, sort of, what should we continue to protest, and, and as reformers, what should we, what should we sort of call people back to? And it sounds so much, that, that a lot of it is, as you said earlier, just, a, just a going back to the past and pulling some things back to yeah, I mean, there's a lot in that question, so I won't do it all justice. But I'll say, I mean, in an, another way, I guess I sometimes think of my apostolate, as it were, is um, trying to remind Protestants they're Catholic. Um, uh, that's not just a kind of inferiority complex project. It's actually saying Catholicity. I would also say, and I say this as somebody who I hope you can appreciate, has deep appreciation uh, uh, for the great tradition and the Roman Catholic tradition. I also don't think Rome owns Catholicity. Do you know what I mean? That Catholicity is a feature of uh, um, Christian communions and traditions um, that is sadly contested today. But I, I do think that, um, and, and I, I also don't think Constantinople owns Catholicity. It's interesting. The, the journey of evangelicals to the East is almost always fundamentalism by another means, interestingly. Um, so I'm, I'm not interested, I'm, I'm less interested in sort of like what divides us. I'm much more interested in what unites us. And I think it's this great tradition that we all sort of draw on in common. Um, it's just that I do think that there are streams of American Christianity that call themselves Protestant that almost don't deserve to do so. Because they can't narrate their connection to Catholicity. I, I think the great burden of, of sort of non... Uh, I was just... How would you say it? The great burden of freelance Christianity in the United States is how it could ever give an, an account of itself as a, an expression of one holy Catholic Church. And I'm not sure that it can. So I, I, this is not me just giving a blank check for everybody to say, you know, everything's good. I do think some streams have more work to do than others. In my own Reformed and Presbyterian tradition, it does look like realizing that I have gifts to receive pre-Calvin, right? And sort of going back to that. Um, I, I'll, I'll, the last thing I'll say is this. Uh, I think in a secular age, what divides us is so much less important than what we have in common. And what we have in common is a commitment to the incarnate God who is met in Jesus and who bears witness to what it looks like to be fully human. And, and interestingly, in professional theology, in many ways and places, the distinction, for example, between Roman Catholics and Protestants is almost meaningless at the level of what we are working on academically and theologically. So, you know, Bill Kavanaugh and I, I see us as just like totally on the same team, even though where we would go on a Sunday would look different. So I think, um, uh, but the, uh, yeah, there's also never an end to reform. There's never an end to the need for renewal and reform. Now, I actually think Vatican II bears witness to that, uh, but I think, and I think American Protestantism seems to have been forgetting that. I mean, well, I don't understand. One of the things that uh, is, shows up in all your work is the importance of liturgies of eating, and I need to dismiss us to that. Uh, we have a reception which is available to everybody. We're just going to be through there in the chapel. Jamie will be here, and you'll have plenty of chance to talk further. Thank you so much for your good questions. Please join me in thanking James. Smith.